Hi, my name is Gina Klingerman and I work for the Bureau of Land Management or the BLM and today I want to talk to you about sagebrush and its importance in the Wyoming ecosystem. I'm also the project manager of a project called the Wyoming Abandoned Minelands Native Plants Project where we grow and plant sagebrush each year in places that have been impacted by mining. Um, so this project is dedicated to restoring sagebrush in places where it's been taken out and decimated. So today I want to share with you some interesting facts about um, sagebrush and sagebrush ecosystems. So a long time before the pioneers crossed Wyoming, sagebrush used to cover 131, 131 million acres. That's a lot of land. So it was all the way from Canada to Mexico, and it's all the way from, you know, covering most of the Western United States. So that's a huge area to have sagebrush, the sagebrush ecosystem. Today, that ecosystem is only about half of that area, or 50%. Um, so I want to talk to you first a little bit about some impacts to sagebrush. So what are the biggest impacts to sagebrush? And right now the biggest impact to sagebrush is wildfire. Um, sagebrush regenerates from its seed and so when a wildfire comes in and burns everything up, there's no way for it to come back. Other impacts to sagebrush include mining, oil and gas development. Um, they other, include other human impacts like urban, urban sprawl or you know, building houses in that ecotone where the sagebrush and the cityscapes meet. Uh, other impacts include invasive species like cheatgrass. We have a big cheatgrass problem across the West. Um, and cheatgrass, it, it'll grow so thick that it'll actually choke the sagebrush out and it won't be able to survive. And then of course we have climate change. As the, as the planet heats up, the sagebrush are not able to do as well. And so they start to die off. So there's a lot of impacts to sagebrush and we're working really hard to keep sagebrush ecosystems healthy. So I want to tell you a little bit about sagebrush. This is a sagebrush right next to me. This is Artemisia tridentata, Wyoming ensis or Wyoming big sage. And this part, sagebrush is known as an aromatic shrub. So this part of the is called the leaf and this is the part of the sagebrush that smells really good and so you can rub your fingers against it and then you can smell that beautiful sage smell that we get and then this part is where the flowers of the sage happen and these are dried out flowers from last year but in when the sage flowers after the summer these will all be full of seeds so right now there's some chaff and there's a, there's a seed right there the seeds are extremely small and the chaff is what we call the extra material or the plant material. So when these sagebrush flower, they'll produce thousands of seeds per, per plant. And the flowers are these beautiful little yellow flowers. And the seeds of the sagebrush are dispersed through wind. So the wind will blow through here and it'll knock the seeds around and the seeds will fall off into the surrounding ground and they'll stay in the soil and be viable for up to a year. Um, after a year, they, if they don't germinate and grow into another plant, then they usually kind of recycle and go back into the earth. So now I just wanna tell you some really cool facts about sagebrush. Um, they grow really, really slowly. So I like to think of them as like the redwoods of Wyoming. This sagebrush plant here could be anywhere from 30 to 80 years old. They grow very, very slowly. And so when you see a big sagebrush like this one, you can think of this as being like the grandfather. It's an old plant. Um, they also provide habitat, crucial habitat, and um, crucial habitat and forage for many species. Over 350 species uh, use sagebrush for their homes, or to eat. So that includes big, large species like elk, pronghorn, mule deer, but also smaller species like sage grouse. We all have heard of sage grouse, but other birds like the sage thrasher, which is this really cool bird. Um, lizards like horny toads and the sagebrush lizards. 
and also bats. There's a lot of bats that rely on sagebrush for habitat and forage because they eat the bugs that come into the sagebrush to, to uh, hide. And then also there's a bunch of bugs that are really cool, like the sagebrush grasshopper, the sagebrush grig, which is a big giant cricket, and the hera moth, which is this beautiful yellow and white moth that pollinates, which means the pollinate, it comes in and gets the nectar off of the sagebrush flowers when they flower in the summer. And I want to tell you a little bit about sagebrush. They're so adaptable. So sometimes you'll be out hiking and you will see these funny little round things on a sagebrush leaf or a stem like this one or this one. And these are called sagebrush galls. And so sometimes parasitic bugs will come and get on the sagebrush and either lay their eggs or try to build a home here. And so the sagebrush will produce this gall. It's kind of like a little tumor to block off that in intrusion or invasion into their into their body so that they can be healthy throughout the rest of the system. And this is a pretty common thing to see in sagebrush and it doesn't mean that they're unhealthy. It's just a way that they protect themselves from predator bugs. Another cool fact about sagebrush is that their roots can grow up to four feet tall. Well, really deep because they're going down in the soil. So that's about this deep. So that's really cool because sagebrush roots help hold together the earth and the soil and they prevent erosion, as do all of the other native plants that are surrounding the sagebrush that live within the canopy. This underneath here is called the canopy of the sagebrush. And also, this is my favorite fact about sagebrush, they can communicate with each other. So during years where it's, there's a lot of drought or there's not much water, and there's a lot of creatures munching on the sagebrush and they're eating up this yummy little green succulent parts of the sagebrush. If they eat too much and it's about to, to impact the sagebrush's health, the sagebrush will produce a thing called a volatile compound. And that volatile compound doesn't taste very good to the animals and so they'll quit eating on that certain sagebrush. But the sagebrush next to it will pick up a signal from the sagebrush of the volatile compound and so the sagebrush next to it will produce the same volatile compound to protect itself from predation or over predation really over munching on the sagebrush so that they can survive so that's a mechanism of survival and it's really cool because science has found that when one plant produces this compound all of the plants around it can tell and they'll produce the same compound so that they can keep themselves healthy and stay alive for the next season. And there's a lot of plants that do this. A lot of them are in Africa, but we're finding more and more plants that do this. Um, and then the other cool, another cool fact about sagebrush is that it relies totally on its seed for reproduction. So some plants will send out these things called rhizomes that move through the soil and then they'll pop up like a foot away from the plant and grow. But sagebrush don't do that. They only do regeneration through their seed, which makes them a little bit vulnerable. And that's why we have the Abandoned Minelands Native Plants Project, where we're helping restore sagebrush ecosystems by planting sagebrush seedlings. So of all of these thousands of seeds that this plant is gonna produce this year, only about five to 8% of those will fall to the ground or be blown into the right conditions and only about five to eight percent of those will grow another sagebrush plant. So it's pretty low and that's why they produce so much seed so they can keep their population stable and alive. But remember that these take a long time to grow. They're very slow growing plants. So sometimes they need help from us. And then my, another one of my favorite facts is that sagebrush are highly adapted to their environments. So no two sagebrush in the state of Wyoming or across the U.S. are going to be the same or have the same needs. So if we took a sagebrush plant from Sheridan, Wyoming, and we tried to transplant it over to Laramie, Wyoming, that sagebrush would probably die because the sagebrush in Sheridan are used to getting more moisture and they're also at a lower elevation. And if we took a sagebrush from Laramie, Wyoming, and we put it in Sheridan, it would probably die too, because they're used to getting less moisture and they are at a much higher elevation. So these sagebrush are uniquely adapted to these tiny niches or little settings, micro settings within their, the area that they, they have grown in. 
So that also makes it hard to reclaim sagebrush because we can't just take seed from, you know, Sinks Canyon sagebrush and take it out to the Gas Hills and plant it because it's not the same environment. And that's where the Abandoned Mindlands Native Plants Project comes in. So through the BLM, we collect the seed in the fall off of these sagebrush plants, and we take it to a greenhouse and we grow it into little seedlings. And we grow those seedlings over the course of a summer, and they get anywhere from four to six inches tall. And then we take all those seedlings out to these areas that have been impacted by mining or other extractive industries and we plant them in the ground and then they get to grow up and replace the sagebrush that used to be there. And so what we do is we, we go to an existing stand of sagebrush in that area and we'll collect that seed that's uniquely um, adapted to the soils and the weather conditions out there. And the coolest part of this project is that we do it with Lander Middle School. So the 6th, 7th, and 8th graders get to volunteer to come out on a field, two field trip days each year, and we get to plant all of these sagebrush seedlings together, and it's a really fun trip. So you might be wondering why sagebrush is so important and why we should take the time to plant seedlings and try to keep this sagebrush from disappearing from the landscape. Well, sagebrush provides a lot of benefit to other plants, like this arrowleaf balsam root right here in front of this sagebrush. It's going to, this sagebrush is gonna hold snow through the winter. So all this snow is gonna build up here. And then in the spring, when this melts down, this arrowleaf balsam root is gonna get extra moisture from the sagebrush. And all of these little grasses grow up within the canopy or the under storage of the sagebrush. So the sagebrush is providing protection for all of the different grasses that you can see, for all of these different wildflowers, and for forbs. And forbs are really essential. They're essential to sage grouse. So sage grouse eat primarily sagebrush and forbs. And without sage in the landscape, a lot of the forbs tend to die off because they don't have the protection and the added moisture that comes from these sagebrush collecting snow over the winter and providing shade throughout the summer for them. 